you ever been part of a group that you knew had to come together as a team and act with a single focus if there was any chance for you to accomplish your goal? If your answer is yes, then you have an idea of what it was like to be in the perfect storm. The Coast Guard awarded Captain Larry Brudnicki the Medal for Heroism. He would never call himself a hero, but this energetic, lighthearted man was at the front lines of the greatest confrontation against the ocean in history. As the captain of the Coast Guard cutter Tamaroa, he embarked on a daring rescue mission that was to be retold in the best-selling book and feature film, The Perfect Storm. How many of you have read the book, The Perfect Storm? And how many of you have seen the movie? Something that always amazes me is that 75% of the people I meet are familiar with the perfect storm. And a question I'm frequently asked is, how did it get that name? Because the words perfect and storm don't go together. It's another oxymoron. At the time, it wasn't called the perfect storm. And it wasn't even a storm in the traditional sense of the word. It was a combination of three independent weather systems. A low pressure system stalled out over Sable Island, Nova Scotia. An extreme high pressure system was propelled southeast from Canada on the jet stream. And the extreme low pressure of Hurricane Grace came up from the Caribbean. All three arrived in the same place at the same time. The resulting storm was five times the size of Hurricane Andrew. And for the first time in living memory, a storm moved in retrograde motion to the west instead of the east. According to the meteorologists, this is the worst weather in more than 100 years. The National Hurricane Center didn't give this storm a name, but it was so big most people thought it deserved a name. Some of the newspapers and magazines called it the no-name storm. Others called it the Halloween storm because it happened around Halloween and they described it in terms of your worst nightmare. When Sebastian Younger was conducting research for his book, he talked to Bob Case, a meteorologist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, because he wanted to know, how do we measure a storm? Well, a typical yardstick is graduated in degrees of bad. How many people died? How many billions of dollars worth of damage? Bob Case said that this storm was so bad, it could not possibly have been any worse. It was the perfect storm. Captain Brudnicki delivers a fast-paced, energetic, and personalized presentation, striking a perfect balance between humor and drama. His story of leadership, teamwork and risk management strategies resonates with audiences everywhere and provides your group with tools they can use immediately to plan for any scenario. Captain Larry Brudnicki, Courage Under Pressure. Before I go back out on patrol, I always read the weather reports and the National Weather Service is calling for 100 mile an hour winds and 60 foot waves. Perhaps the blue skies and the gentle breeze on shore cause some sailboats to not take the warning seriously. Maybe they would have if the National Weather Service had mentioned the book or the fact that the movie was going to star George Clooney. <laughs> we found out the movie was coming out. My wife started joking with all of her friends. Carol said, by the time Hollywood's done with this, you'll easily recognize Larry. He'll be the 20-year-old female. <laughs> As it turns out, the actor who plays me is six foot four and weighs 300 pounds. Now Carol says, when I got home, I was soaking wet, so she threw me in the dryer and I shrank. <laughs> These rescues took place in a way that's almost beyond imagination. They were successful because everyone was where he needed to be, doing what he needed to do when he needed to do it. That's the power of a team acting with a single focus. And the movie is a good depiction of the life of a commercial fisherman. It's given tremendous Coast Guard exposure, and it's great entertainment. Captain Brudnicki teaches your organization the same strategies that he used to succeed at a wide variety of high-risk missions, including the Exxon Valdez oil spill, countless counter-drug operations, directing Coast Guard operations during the America's Cup, and spearheading engineering operations for a presidential inauguration. We're racing to the scene at three miles per hour. David Revolta starts to descend. When he's low enough, he'll have his crew jump out of the helicopter and into the water. And I don't know about you, but I have never understood why anybody would jump out of an airplane. It has never made any sense to me until this night, because this airplane's about to crash. When a plane ditches, quite often, the pilot does not survive the impact with the water. 
If this crew jumps out first, maybe they can live. He's low enough. Dave starts with his pararescue jumpers because these people jump out of airplanes for a living. The first is Rick Smith because Rick is the best pararescue jumper at the 106th rescue wing. And I'd like for a moment for you to imagine that you are Rick Smith. You're 32 years old. You're sitting at the door of the helicopter preparing to jump. What are you thinking? Are you trying to recall some of the finer points you learned in pararescue jumper school about jumping into extreme weather? Are you thinking about your wife and your upcoming eighth anniversary? Or maybe, what costumes are your three children going to wear for Halloween? Where do you say a prayer? Time for preparation's over. You jump. What are you feeling? Courage or fear? You're the best at this and you know it. But no one, no one has ever jumped into weather this extreme before. A second later, you disappear from sight of the helicopter. The other pararescue jumper, John Splane, wants to time his jump. And if you can imagine the helicopter hovering as the waves are rising and falling, if you can time your jump to land on the crest of the wave, instead of landing in the truck, you fall a shorter distance and with waves this big, that difference is significant. But John can't see the waves to time his jump. He jumps blindly. He's falling. He's falling. Then the thought occurs to him, my gosh, I'm falling a long time. This is a man who jumps out of airplanes for a living. When John hits the water, he's traveling at 60 miles an hour. He's knocked unconscious. At that speed, water takes on the properties of concrete. When he comes to, he doesn't know where he is or why he's even out there. All he knows is he's in the middle of the ocean somewhere and he's severely injured. He's broken a number of bones, including some ribs that have damaged his internal organs. He has massive internal bleeding. Pararescue jumpers are not doctors, but they get extensive med medical training because they have a mission of wartime search and rescue. When you find the crew of an airplane that's been shot down, quite often you're going to find people with injuries that are life-threatening. The good news and the bad news is John has an idea of the extent of his injuries. Dave Revolta, the co-pilot, has the night vision goggles he was wearing when they were attempting to refuel with the tanker. He flips them down. He can see the waves. He times his jump, and he jumps without 